everyone. One minute late due to some technical uh, issues here, but we are working through it. It is Monday, August 15th, halfway through the month of August. Hard to believe here. Uh, I'm Mayor Chris Jensen coming to you live from the city of Noblesville, and we are here with another edition of Mental Health Monday. We're so excited to have you here on a beautiful, actually it's pretty gray, but anyways, it could be beautiful wherever you're at, Monday morning, because uh, we have listeners and viewers from all over the world, which is awesome. So I am joined once again by a great friend of mine, somebody who offers so much time, talent, and treasure to the city of Noblesville, Kristen Boyce, the owner of Pathways of Healing Counseling. Good morning, Kristen. Good morning, Mayor Jensen. And our special guest. Oh, Andy. our special guest. You teed it off. I guess it's not a surprise since she's right here on the screen with us. Another good friend of mine, a fellow Nobles of High School graduate, a amazing singer and vocalist, and all around good person, Maggie Owens. Maggie, good morning. Maggie's with the Indiana Center for Prevention and of Youth Abuse and Suicide. I had to look at my notes on that one because I just knew I would probably give you a new title and a whole new company if I didn't. So good morning, Maggie. Good morning. Thanks for having me. We are so glad to have you. Um, we all sound so positive right now, but we're probably going to dive into somewhat of a, a heavier topic today. But um, we're positive because we're having these conversations. So I'm not going to prevent anyone from smiling while we're even talking about this because the fact that we're talking about it, the fact that we're leaning into it has been a goal from day one of Kristen and myself uh, when we launched this program two and a half years ago that we're going to we're going to tackle some meaty topics today and, and really all the time. So we are going to lean in and talk a little bit about youth abuse and suicide prevention. Uh, you know, a warning, if that's something that might trigger you, please, you know, be aware of that, that we are going to kind of dive into to the heavy conversation. Know that we would totally respect if you need to tune out or um, you know, look away for a little bit or, or go do something else and rejoin us. Absolutely respect that as with any conversation that we have here, but we know that today's conversation will be a little bit heavy. So in order to get us ready for that heavy conversation, we always start with a wonderful exercise, which is square breathing. And I'll turn that over to Kristen Boyce to lead us through that. Good morning, everyone. We are so glad you're here with us today. You matter, you're important, and you're loved. Mm -hmm. And I just want to reiterate that as we're talking through some hard a hard topic today. So in order to tolerate what we might be talking about today, we're going to really work on our breathing so we can breathe through that discomfort, regulate our nervous system, and come back to calm and centered. So first thing we're going to do is put our feet on the floor, and you're going to press into your feet. This helps kind of center you and keep you in your body. And the reason why that's important is when we leave our body, we really aren't connected to what's happening in the present moment. And this will help you come back to the present moment, be able to take in, metabolize, and process what comes up. So feet on the floor. We're gonna take a big deep inhale through your nose. We're gonna hold for four, kind of belly to the spine if you can, and then exhale through your mouth for eight. So let's do two breaths together, pressing feet into the floor, big deep inhale. Hold and release. Just reconnect to your body, your nervous system. Take one deep, another deep inhale through your nose and release. I recommend you really practice this every hour on a regular basis. So when you feel activated in your nervous system, you feel stuck, you feel like it's too much, you come back to the breath to help you come back to calm. Love it. Um, you know, funny story on this breath thing. I was talking this weekend to my uh, third, my third younger or third oldest child, Hank, whatever it is. Um, and he was actually talking about breathing this weekend. And he was talking about, he's, he's very inquisitive and he brought up, he's like, so when you stop breathing, you die. Very literal too. And I was like, well, there's, there's a lot more to that, but it was very just through the, the mind of a five and a half year old. Yes. When you stop breathing, you die. And so when you stop breathing on a daily basis, you get yourself into a bad situation. So I just thought that was a cute moment this weekend from him who saw it from a very literal standpoint as well, but very important and really the baseline of what we're working from here. So um, as we dive into this conversation, which I'm going to turn it over to Kristen here in a minute to kind of tee it up, and then she can probably pass to Maggie to maybe introduce a little bit about the organization that Maggie works for. Um, and then we'll kind of go into some question and answer. And, and obviously this is kind of a, this can be applied, this topic can be applied not just on youth, 
Uh, there's going to be trigger warnings for anyone um, who might be dealing with folks that are uh, really have suicidal ideations or, or any concerning thoughts too. So uh, there's a lot that you can take from this, even if you're sitting there thinking, well, I don't know anybody who is, is contemplating this or I may not deal with it myself. Just take a listen. You know, you're going to learn something today a little bit, something to pick up from. And I know, Kristen, you and I have tackled this topic before on a on a broader scale. So I'm interested to kind of narrow in a little bit and talk more on maybe a youth perspective as well. If you have any questions um, today and want to chime in and ask a question, feel free. Um, if you want to just say hi, you can feel free to do that. If you want to private message one of us to kind of ask some more personal questions, fully respect that as well, um, knowing that it is a meaty topic. So there's all my disclaimers there that I've laid out. For this, and then I'll pass it over to the real experts, uh, Kristen Boyce, if you want to kind of take it from there to kind of enter the topic, and we'll work on from there. Yes, the first thing I want to say is at any point during this time, if you need to, you're having suicidal thoughts, you can text 988 or call 988 at any point. So I want to make sure we put that out there in case someone needs that more immediately, that it's available right now, 24-7, any Anytime you need it, it's the Suicide Prevention Hotline, Crisis Hotline, 988 is the number. And so without further ado, Maggie, welcome. We're Hello. excited you're here. Tell us a little bit about what you do, the organization, what you do. And then my goal for our goal for the conversation is to decrease the stigma and equip people on how to approach this conversation about suicide because people are scared. They're gonna say the wrong thing. They're gonna plant a seed. They're going to trip something in, or trigger something in someone. So, and the other thing is prevention. So tell us a little bit about the organization and your role. Absolutely. So like Mayor Jensen said at the start, I am with the Indiana Center for Prevention of Youth Abuse and Suicide. If you are been around Hamilton County for a long time. We were previously known as Chaucey's Place. So we are a prevention education organization that work directly with students and families on child abuse prevention, child sexual abuse prevention, and suicide prevention. So in the state of Indiana, it is mandated in kindergarten through 12th grade that every student receive body safety education every year. So we provide that to, um, we were in 103 different school buildings last year providing that education. Um, in addition to that, we also offer some suicide prevention programs and an adult focused child sexual abuse prevention program. My role in the organization is I am the director of education and community relations. So I get to be out and about sharing these topics, talking about it in a way that makes people comfortable, as well as um, just helping to educate our communities and our families. And Excellent. Maggie, you have a background in education, correct? I do. I was a I Noblesville <laughs> school teacher for 10 years. I have a master's in curriculum. And so I help write our curriculum. And I'm actually getting a post-master's certification right now in social emotional learning. Fantastic. So let's jump into one. Let's start with warning signs. Mm -hmm. If someone is showing signs that they don't, they say, I don't want to be here. I want to die, or they might not say anything. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the warning signs so people can know what to look for? So this is the, the tricky thing is that not every person is the same. So they're not going to demonstrate the same warning signs as, as somebody else. And it may not be as clear as saying, I want to die or I don't want to be here. But there are some of those direct verbal cues, like I don't want to be here, I want to go to sleep and never wake up. Um, and there are some behavioral indicators as well. Obviously, we know that mental health and substance abuse go hand in hand. So somebody who has increased the amount of substance that they might have, whether that's drinking or other drugs, that is an indicator that might be a concern for somebody. Um, there are, you know, giving away possessions is something that we see a lot of times. That is an indication that they're giving away the things that are important to them because they they aren't going to need those things anymore. Um, so there's a variety of different signs and warning signs that we see and experience both from the youth as well as um, our adults. I mean, for example, if somebody is making their end of life um, plans in place, I mean, that is something that obviously as an adult, you wanna have those things Put in place for when um, your time here on earth is done but we, when we see those those fixations on planning the ends of what what's going to be the end um, obviously stockpiling any kind of pills or stockpiling any kind of means in order to take their life that is going to be an indication of something going on as well 
And so how do we have conversations if we suspect someone's, we notice their mood shifting, their behaviors of shifting, they're isolating more, something, we just, something is we, in our soul. We're like, there's something going on. How do we approach the conversation? That is a really important thing to have. I mean, I know that Chris and you and I were saying before we even got started that, you know, when I was growing up, suicide and suicide thoughts were not a dinner table conversation. That wasn't something that that was openly talked about. But I think that we are changing that stigma. We are changing that trajectory where we are having these conversations because it's important to have these conversations, right? And so talking about feelings, emotions, what, what we're going through on a regular basis is just going to open up that door of communication. And so when we're thinking about how to approach this, I think it's really just going, sometimes you just have to jump in with two feet and say, hey, I've noticed that you're not acting yourself. What's going on? Are you having thoughts of harming yourself? Are you having thoughts of suicide? Like, let, let's have a conversation because even though so many times people think that having that conversation is putting the idea in the mind of someone, what you're doing is opening that door to be able to have an ongoing conversation. So if I'm worried about a friend of mine, I've noticed that their behavior has changed. I've noticed that they are withdrawing and isolating. The best thing that I can do is reach out and say, I've noticed these things. Tell them the things that you've noticed, how their behavior has changed. Because if they're not having thoughts of harming themselves, they maybe didn't even realize that they were withdrawing. Maybe they didn't even realize that they were acting this way. But by being a good friend and having that conversation and reaching out to them, you're now showing that you care. You're showing that you're concerned about them. You're bringing up some behavioral changes that maybe they weren't aware of. And then they know that ultimately then they know that you care about them. And so, so many times when we talk to kids, we know that in the time of a suicide attempt or suicide ideation, most of the time that student has shared with somebody that they were having these thoughts, but they follow it up with, but don't tell anyone. So we have to teach these kids and everybody really that these are the kinds of secrets that you tell somebody. These are the kinds of things, even if you feel like they're going to be mad at you, if you're concerned about somebody, you're going to feel horrible if something happens and you never and you never share that information. So these are the, those kinds of situations where we reiterate to them, all secrets can be told, even secrets where you think that, you know, they might hurt themselves or they're going to be mad at you. Those are the kinds of things that are the good secrets that you need to share in order to make sure that your friend is safe. I think that's a really important point on secrets because we know secrets can make us sick. And when we're little, we're scared. Like we don't want to lose a friend or we don't want to upset someone. We don't want someone to be mad at us. What other kinds of secrets? Because I know you deal with sexual abuse as well when it comes to secret keeping, because this is a really big topic um, in terms of suicide and right. It, they go hand in hand. Absolutely. So if someone, what other secrets are really important that somebody share with somebody? Yeah. So we teach our kids in kindergarten through 12th grade that all secrets can be told. And so that is anything from somebody sending you inappropriate pictures. You know, in this day of te technology, we know that sextortion is a huge thing right now. And so if you're not familiar with what sextortion is, it's really exploiting a child in a sexual way. But then um, kids are taking their life because of this, because they have shared a picture and somebody says that they're going to hurt them or they need to pay them thousands of dollars in order to get it back. Kids are taking their life because of this. And so any kind of this sexual exploitation, any kind of somebody that is looking at touching, taking pictures of your private parts or asking you to look at, take pictures, touch their private parts, those are the kinds of secrets that get people in trouble. And so, we we tell our our kids that if somebody if that's happening to you it is never your fault it never can make you any less special it can't take away your dignity but those are the kinds of secrets that you need to tell someone so that you can be safe so if a friend is telling you that they have been abused or they have had somebody taking pictures of them that if a friend tells you that, that's the other kind of thing that you need to go tell somebody else. We, we teach our kids about their trusted adults. We encourage them to have trusted adults at school, at outside of school, whether they're it's in their church or if it's a coach, if it's their mom or their dad or their grandma or their grandpa. But we encourage them to have lots of trusted adults because sometimes it's that trusted adult that's violating the child. And so if that's happening, then they need to have 
other adults that they can talk to and that they feel they can trust to get them get them the safety and the and the help they need. What are the statistics on the abuse that happens with somebody you know versus a stranger? So 90% of the abuse of, of child sexual abuse happens with somebody that they know. Um, and it may not be somebody, and, and we know that these perpetrators often groom the whole family. So it's somebody that the whole family is usually connected to that is violating a child. And so that's the, as a mom, I have two kids. I have an 11 year old and a nine year old. And, you know, I, I, some may say I'm a little protective, but I, I ask the questions and I think it's important to know if your child's going to an overnight, who else is going to be in the house? Do they have brothers or sisters that are going to have friends over? Where do you keep your firearm? Do you have a firearm in your house? I mean, I, I probably come across a little bit like a crazy parent and that's okay because if I'm being a crazy parent to protect my kids, I, I'm fine with being the crazy person. Yes. And I think these are conversations that we don't like the more we can talk about this and the more we just openly have this dialogue mm -hmm. in our home and outside of our home and at school, this becomes a normalized conversation and it takes that discomfort and that fear down. Mm -hmm. I use an example that my, my son last year came home from school and he was in fifth grade and somebody that sat next to him said that he didn't want to be here anymore. And my son came to me and he was like, I don't, I know what that means. Like, what do I do with this information? But because we've had this conversation, we've had open, honest, raw conversations with our kids, they know what to do with that information. So he reported it to the school counselor, the school counselor met with the child. It was kind of a misunderstanding, but if he wouldn't have done something then that child could have been really thinking about taking their life and if we don't have these conversations, we see kids younger and younger that are feeling these suicide ideations that feel like they don't want to be, be around anymore. And it's happening so much younger than I think we realized even as, as adults that these kids are struggling in such a way. Maggie, can I chime in and ask a question? Yeah. Um, can we back up to, uh, this is, this is such a, uh, it's a heavy conversation, but it's a, absolutely needed one. And, and my kids are have young kids as well. And, um, but I wanted to, to reach back on the, on the suicide conversation and, you know, how to just ask that question of, of a kid or a child. And if they're having those thoughts. So if I'm sitting here watching today and I'm like, yeah, that sounds great, Maggie, that I'm just going to, you know, I'm sure that, that you want me to just go ask, like, do you feel like you might commit suicide? You know, I, in a perfect world, yes. If I'm not comfortable doing that though, and I'm like, okay, well, what's the next best thing that I could do if it wasn't that? Can we maybe drill in a little bit on maybe some other techniques yeah. um, as an adult, even that might not feel comfortable? How would you go about, or, you know, I thought we might expand on that for a minute. For sure. So we say like, it doesn't matter how you ask the question necessarily, but it's the importance that you do ask some questions. I mean, the, if you overthink the words that you're going to say, then you're going to end up sounding blubbering and it's not going to come across, across in a clear fashion. And if you truly do not think that you can have those conversations, whether it's, you don't, you're, you just are so worried about saying the wrong thing or doing the, doing it wrong, find somebody to ask those questions. So reach out to the, a, a teacher, reach out to the school counselor and, and express, if you have concerns about somebody, the best thing you can do is make somebody aware that you're concerned. Ideally, it's going to be having that conversation directly with the individual, but if you truly don't think that you can, find somebody that can. My, my family were big journalers, and so I can maybe even, if I was concerned about Wyatt, my 11-year-old, maybe it's I write in a journal and we journal back and forth. I mean, I think that's a good, good philosophy for for parents to do because sometimes your kid may not want to talk to you, but they may be, be a lot more comfortable putting it in writing. So if you are concerned, put it in writing, write it down in a note. That way you can pre-think what you're going to say. You can formulate your thoughts and you can put it in writing and then give that to them in that capacity. That's another option. Kristen, do you have any good points there? I think how are you feeling is a great one to start. And some people go, I don't know, or terrible, or just tell me more about that. You know, those kinds of connective conversations get it started mm -hmm. because 
having a prompt, like, how are you feeling? I'm fine. Feelings inside, not expressed. We've talked about that many times. We can say, well, tell me more because I can sense something in my gut says something's going on. And you could be out. And I say, I could be out to lunch. I like to say this, like I could be out to lunch and you can tell me that I'm out to lunch and something in my gut just says there's something going on. I can see it in your eyes. And people feel afraid to be seen. I think it's important to make that note because we think we all want to be seen. We all want to be, we all do. We want to be understood. But then when we really are seen, that's really vulnerable and scary for a lot of people. We're used to kind of masking it maybe, or we're just kind of like, don't look at me. Don't see me. I want to hide because I'm in shame. So being seen is very vulnerable, especially when someone is asking you when maybe nobody has really cared. You felt like nobody's really cared about you. And all of a sudden somebody's asking, what do you, what do you think, Maggie, about that? I, I agree. I think, well, wholeheartedly agree with that. I think that the tell me more is such an important phrase that we can use in lots of different ways, right? Like we can have it about our feelings. We can have it about, you know, what else is going on? Asking those open-ended conversations questions are the way that we're going to get people to talk more. So the tell me more. I also think that um, putting your own judgment aside when you're having these kinds of conversations. I mean, that's one thing we teach the adults not to say, like, you're not going to do something stupid, like kill yourself, right? Like putting your own judgment away because they already, you don't want to put your feelings on them. They're already overwhelmed with their own emotions and feelings that taking away any any form of judgment about how they're feeling or what their plan might be just coming coming to it on a neutral territory i mean you may have your own own opinions on suicide and death but you you shouldn't put that on somebody that is experiencing crisis mode i mean they are in full body crisis mode at that moment and so Take take the deep breath before you have the conversation. Approach it from a in a calm manner and just be open. And, and you yourself are being vulnerable if you're having that conversation. That it, it's okay. It's okay to feel vulnerable. It's okay to be nervous about having that conversation. Having that conversation. It's it, it's okay to do that and feel that way. I thought Maggie, that was a great point about kind of the how not to approach the conversation. I, I thought maybe we, could we drill down on that a little bit more, Kristen? I bet you have some thoughts too on how not to approach maybe some of these because that sometimes that's even more helpful than the other way. And and I, you know, we talk about this across every spectrum of mental health, Kristen. You know, especially you and I talk about when it comes to parenting. I am just as guilty of like you know telling my kid that he's fine, buck up, stop crying, you know all that stuff, all the wrong things. We do that, and there's certainly wrong things about this. This could this these wrong things could have bigger consequences though and ramifications. So could we dive in on a little of the what not to do? Yeah, uh, and Kristen, you can inter interrupt and chime in whenever you want. But I think that really just there are, obviously in our training we use one of the examples is you look pretty miserable. Well, that might make somebody <laughs> feel pretty bad, right? And that may shut them down. So try and eliminate anything that may be a roadblock. So saying you're not going to do something dumb, suicide is dumb, any of those kinds of things, putting any negative connotation into the, the way that you're having the conversation are obviously things to avoid. Um, to be able to just ask, how are you feeling? What's going on with you? Again, having open-ended conversations because you don't want to ask yes or no, because then that shuts the conversation down. It shuts that door of communication. So open-ended open is the best way to do things with the tell me more. Explain to me how you're feeling today. Explain to me what's going on in your life. Help me understand what's happening in your world. We haven't connected in a while. Tell me, tell me some things that are happening with you. You know, just open-ended, giving them the floor to be able to share what's happening and what's going on. And I think you're making some great points. The other thing is if we come at it shaming them, so we kind of mentioned that, like, what's wrong with you? Why, what You're so angry. Like my facial expression, I am not showing compassion. I'm not offering kindness. I'm not softening myself. My fear underneath that is probably a lot of fear 
that something bad's going to happen or I'm scared something bad's going to happen or maybe it's bringing up something from me from my past that is that's activating for me because I'm scared of losing somebody maybe there's some unprocessed grief there and I think really checking how you're delivering like what's your tone what are your facial expressions are you regulated because if you're really dysregulated, the person's going to be protective of themselves. They're not going to feel safe. So in order to have this conversation, the, the key is you, you can't make someone feel safe. But if you are offering compassion, kindness, and you're regulated and you're calm, that's going to transcend to the person on the other end that you care about them, that you truly care about them. Mm -hmm. There's not another motive there. And if I have to manage my own fear around the conversation, it doesn't mean I'm not going to have fear. I certainly will because this is a big conversation. Um, one of our therapists, this really stuck with me. We were in, we were having a team meeting and we were talking about this subject. And I, it took me by, like, it kind of took me back. And one of her trainings, she was told that if someone says, yes, I kind of am contemplating it to ask a more concrete question because the brain doesn't fully develop until 25. And this was the question, do you want to be dead buried in the ground? And that's a big, it's a big statement, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I mean, I saw your facial expression, Mayor Jensen. It's a, it took me by surprise too, but the question is more tangible. Like this is really the reality of it. Do you want to be dead buried in the ground? And if someone says yes, and they have a plan and they have means and they have a timeline, you need immediate help. So let's talk about that. If someone is suicidal, what's the next steps? Well, you mentioned earlier about 988, and I think that's great. But what some people don't realize is that you can call 988 or contact the crisis text line because you're concerned about somebody. You don't have to be the person in crisis to make those connections. If you're worried about somebody, you can contact 988 or the crisis text line is 741741 and you can get connected that way. I just think that the biggest thing is being aware of the resources. I mean, being aware of what's out there to help, being, you know, having contacts of knowing I can call 988 at any time if I'm concerned about anybody and somebody there can walk me through what I need to do and how to handle that situation. And that is, I spoke at your conference uh -huh. and after the conference, someone came up to me and she's like, I have a friend that I'm concerned about. And I, I don't think I can have the conversation. And what I recommended is she call at the time it was 1-800-273-TALK. Now it's 988. I said, call 988, get them on the phone, have your friend there and they will walk you through the whole process. And you can just say, I'm concerned about my friend. I don't know what to do or say. She's having suicidal thoughts. Can you help me? Yep. And you can have it on speakerphone and you have support right then and there. Because if you're afraid, I don't know what to say, they can help you walk you through that. You don't have to do it alone. Mm -hmm. And that one phone call right there is just a huge gift to you, to them, you know, and, and let them take it from there. You know, I think that's what people don't realize. It's like just there are people out there chomping at the bit to walk you through this. Right. And I think so many people think that only if I'm if I'm feeling suicidal. I can call that number. It's there. It is a gift. It is a resource for everybody at any time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. If you have concerns and you need help having a conversation, or if you want to express it, these are the things that you have noticed about a friend or a loved one. Should I be concerned? You can call and ask those questions. And somebody who is skilled in this topic can help you. They can give you the resources. They can direct you to the next step. They can encourage you that, yes, you have every reason to be concerned and talk to your friend or your loved one. I mean, I think that it's such an incredible resource that is available at our fingertips every day. It's awesome. I'm so grateful it is. The other thing is if you're with somebody and you don't want to say anything, you can text them while you're with the person mm -hmm. and they can text you back prompts, you know, mm -hmm. questions to ask, resources, how to plug them in. So there's that's what I love about it. You can text or call. Well, and we're all, at, you know, on our phone being very rude at dinner all the time anyway. So it wouldn't even be that, you know, it, it, you wouldn't even know. But to your point, it can be discreetly done. But on that same note, I think it's important when you are engaged in this conversation and you are asking somebody about their, if they have suicide intent, that your phone is put away. Because mm -hmm. if you are coming across as being distracted by something and that, you're putting that barrier up. I, I tell parents and teachers all the time, like put the phone down when you're having this conversation. Yes, you might need to have some 
prompts or some, something like that. But as much as you can, remove any distraction that is around. And, and when you're having this conversation, I tell the teachers, this isn't a passing period conversation. This isn't a, I have five minutes between classes to ask these kids. You have to have intentional time and you need to have an opportunity to sit down and hear because they may not come out right away and say, these are my, my, my intents, but they may tell you everything that has led up to why they are feeling the way that they are. And so that may be a very long, open conversation before you get to what's really going on. And so prepare to have to spend time with that, that person, prepare to truly invest and engage with that individual and not have it be a surface level conversation. Awesome. Well, uh, I told you, Maggie, this would go by really fast and it's already been 30 minutes. So Ooh. thank you. Thank you so much, Maggie Owens, uh, for helping us address this very, very heavy conversation. Uh, several actually issues that, that we dealt with here between youth suicide and also um, you know, sexual abuse as well. Both are incredibly serious issues. And I think you helped shine some light on it. Kristen Boyce, you're always amazing. I think the, the takeaway here today is 988 is there for you. Call it, text it, be ready. Um, to have those honest conversations. Um, thank you, everyone, for tuning in today. Kristen, thank you. Maggie, thank you. Uh, we will be back in two weeks with another topic. But uh, in the meantime, stay safe. Reach out if you need help and know that you are not alone. So thanks again. I appreciate you guys. Thank you.